Whose job is it? You might have asked that question before. You might have asked that question in different areas of your life. You've probably asked that question at home, maybe with kids or with grandkids. Or maybe you've been asked that question when you ask one of them to do a chore and they say, well, that's not my job, somebody else's job. And the the question of who's supposed to be doing the job comes up, doesn't it? It always comes up in workplaces, doesn't it? A staff or a group of colleagues come together and there's a new responsibility or some new situation and, and we need to adapt a little bit and there's new work that needs to be done. The question comes up, whose job is that? This, word, this, this question comes up in different times, different ways. Different people answer it in different ways and it comes up in the life of the church too. The church has circumstances that it faces, ministries that need to be done, and the question comes up again and again, whose job is it? Who will fill that role? Different people answer the question in different ways, and it's become increasingly common in the last few decades to see pastors and church staff as the people whose job it is, who do the ministry, the professionals, who go off to school and get a degree, some kind of master's, if not some other advanced degree, and they come back and they're trained. And that's, my, that's the way my, I relate to my doctor. He or she went to school and got trained and became a professional. Or my vet went to school and became a professional. Or my accountant. Or the teachers. We have a lot of professionals in our lives. And, and we can kind of begin to see ministry that way as well, the life of the church. And so a lot of times, the answer to the whose job is it question is, well, it's the pastor's job, or it's the secretary's job, or, or it's the worship pastor's job, or somebody on the payroll. And it's absolutely crucial, and we spend a lot of time with Staff Parish Relations, our personnel committee, working on how we can do that sort of thing well, but there's also a danger. It's really important to have certain people who are devoted as a vocation or even a career to the life of the church and to to leadership and organization and to administration because not everybody has the time for that after they get off in the evenings or the energy (laughs) for that matter. So we need some people to do it. The danger, though, is in seeing ministry as the exclusive property of that group of people. It's a danger because it can mean we're not as involved in the ministry of the kingdom as we could be or should be. And it's a danger because the Bible just doesn't talk about ministry that way. In fact, when the Bible talks about ministry, it talks about ministry belonging to the believers. It talks about ministry belonging to the whole church. It even says it's the pastor's job to train the church, to do the ministry. So there's people who are set apart for organizing it, and there are people who are being trained to do it. And so sometimes if we kind of slide into this frame of reference and look at the life of the church like we look at our doctor's office, I don't have the knowledge or the capacity or the training to do what they do, so I'm just going to sit back and let them do it because i got other things going on, and who has the time anyway? If we approach church that way, we run into problems with our missional effectiveness. Because if there's a mission before us, a mission to take the good news of God's kingdom, come through Jesus in the gospel to the ends of the earth, well, how effective are we going to be if the three or four people on the payroll are the only ones doing it? There's over a hundred of you sitting in chairs right now, do you think we'd be more effective if one person does it or if 101 people do it? You don't have to answer that. The answer should be obvious. (laughs) So again, you know, like like if I'm I'm doing the work and and putting in the energy, I can reach a certain number of people. I can can be in ministry with a certain group of people. But there are going to be limits because there are only so many hours in the day. But If our leaders are equipping everybody else who shows up to be reaching people for the kingdom of God, then we're in a position to 
expand the influence of the kingdom in ways we never could if only one person does it. The spectator mentality or the consumer mentality or the professional preacher mentality therefore has really negative implications for the mission of the church, doesn't it? That's what they learned in Acts chapter 6. So the good news is we're not the first person to wrestle with the whose job is it question. We're not the first person for the first group of Christians to wrestle with, like, how do we delegate things and how do we share ministry responsibilities and, and who's going to do the teaching and the preaching and who's going to study Greek and Hebrew and syntax and read commentaries and who's going to organize people into band meetings and, and who's going who's to make sure that that somebody gets a meal on a Wednesday night, and who's going to make sure the youth get fed, and who's going to greet people when they come in the, in the door. There are all these questions. And the thing that we begin to see in Acts chapter 6 is that the apostles themselves wrestled with the same questions and created a process of shared ministry so that they, continue, they could continue to see the, the kingdom expand. The apostles offered most of the leadership in the early church as the church in Jerusalem grew. And as it grew, it got a little bit too big to handle. They needed some help. They knew they were going to have to share the ministry because they also knew that missional effectiveness depends on shared ministry. That's the bottom line today. Missional effectiveness, if we want to be effective, we've got to share this. We've got to recognize that different people play different roles. Different, some, some of us are going to spend more time doing some things, and others are going to spend some time doing some other things. But missional effectiveness depends on shared ministry. Now, that principle emerges in the midst of a problem in Acts 6. Like, problems arise. We have to address the problem, and those things about the life of the church and the ministry. So, so there's a problem that they encounter. Uh, there's a conflict, and the conflict is related to some ethnic divisions. No surprise there. Throughout the history of the world, we see conflict, whether it's in the church or out of the church, and often it's related to ethnic divisions. So Acts chapter 6, during those days, this is just after the apostles have been brought before the Jerusalem council and been told, don't go around talking about Jesus don't put his death on our heads. Don't make problems for us. Just be quiet. Go home. Go back to work. Go back to your fishing boats and stop talking about Jesus. They didn't do that. Thanks be to God, the apostles. They said we're going to obey God rather than human beings. But this is the context. Acts chapter 6, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number. So we've, already, we've been reading through Acts and we've heard about how on Pentecost, Peter starts preaching thousands of people get converted, get baptized, and become followers of Jesus. And that just that kind of thing just keeps happening. The gospel is spreading like wildfire through Jerusalem in these early days of the life of the church. And that just continues. That's why they got so much negative attention from the power players. Because these blue-collar fishermen guys were getting more attention than, you know, the power player guys. And they didn't like that, so they wanted them to stop. They didn't. That's what they wanted. During those days, the disciples were increasing in number. The Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. What's going on here? Probably what you've got is Hellenists is kind of a word for folks who speak Greek or with, a, with, with Greek ethnicity or Greek background, right? So the Hellenists are probably uh, the, the widows in the community with a Greek background or a non-Jewish background. Maybe they're from Turkey or Asia Minor or somewhere a little further west, and now they're in Jerusalem, and they're part of the life of the church, but they're not of Hebrew descent. So you got the Hellenists, Greek-speaking widows, and you got the Hebrews, who would be the widows of Hebrew descent, who probably spoke Hebrew or perhaps Aramaic. And so there's this, there's, this, there's this ethnic distinction that's probably also marked by a language distinction. One group speaks Greek, and the other speaks likely Aramaic. And they're in Jerusalem, and so the outsiders, the Hellenists, the Greek speakers, probably feel like the insiders, the Hebrews, are getting preferable treatment, right? And so they start complaining, and maybe they get somebody to plead their case, and they say, hey, 
our widows aren't getting as much food as your widows. There's some distribution happening. We've been pooling our resources. You read about that earlier in Acts. And the distributions are unequal. And the people, your folks are getting preferable treatment and our folks are getting overlooked. So the apostles realize they have a problem on their hands. They've got a lot to do. We know Peter's a preacher. The apostles have been devoted to the ministry of the word. That's what got them in trouble with the power players. They're preaching Jesus every chance they get. They're studying the scriptures. They're looking at how the Old Testament points to Jesus. A lot of you have studied that on Wednesday nights, by the way, how the Old Testament puts us aimed straight to Jesus. So if you've been in the, in, in the group that Tanya has been leading, kind of tracing some of those things, that's the kind of thing they're doing. You know from experience, takes a little bit of work, doesn't it? You got to dig into the scriptures and, and, and spend some time praying, Spirit of God, won't you open my eyes to help me see clearly what it is you're doing. Help me understand. Help me perceive. Give me eyes to see the work you're doing. And so the apostles know if the church is going to flourish, the word of God cannot be neglected. Let me say that again. If the church is going to flourish, if the church is going to be effective, we see first, in, like right here, the apostles say, we should not neglect the word of God. Their job, number one, is to make sure that they are students of Scripture so that they can instruct the church and teach the church and form the church. Not just so everybody can know their Bible verses faster than everybody else. That's great if you know your Bible verses faster than everybody else. But so people can know God. This isn't just about, you know, winning the Bible trivia game. This is about how God makes himself known and how he gives life. You may remember earlier in Acts when Peter's preaching about Jesus, when he's preaching how Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the Scriptures described, going back all the way. The Spirit of God works powerfully in that, and people come to life. People get regenerated. When the word is preached, people get saved. So the apostles say, we can't neglect that. We can't neglect the preaching of the word. If you want missional effectiveness, somebody's got to be preaching. And if there's no preaching of the word, forget the health of the church. And if the preaching of the word is kind of a secondary or third or fourth, you know, I'll get to that when I can get to it because I got a lot of other stuff on my schedule. Don't expect the church to be vibrant and healthy. Like if, if the preaching of the word is an afterthought, don't expect an effective ministry. So hear it again. The apostles say, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. That's no criticism of waiting on tables. It's just a, a recognition that this thing has grown beyond what these 12 apostles can do. They need help. And imagine, like, like they got 12 people on staff. <laughs> they got 12 preachers on staff. Could you even imagine what that would be like? And it's too much. And so what do they do? They need some people to help out with ministries of mercy and care and the, the food ministry, like, like the food pantry needs some help. And so what do they do? They identify people and they identify a process, right? Here's a problem. There's too much for this one group of leaders to do. So we need some more people who can be, who can address this problem and make sure that everybody's treated fairly and make sure everybody's taken care of and nobody gets overlooked. And so the apostles are saying, like, we're going to be devoted to teaching, preaching, prayer, to these aspects of the life of the community, and we're going to pick seven men, seven people, who have these characteristics, men of good standing, right? we trust them, they have a good reputation in the community, full of the Spirit, God is at work in their lives, in them and through them, and wisdom. 
because you don't want people running things who lack wisdom. Let me just tell you. <laughs> if somebody's going to be responsible for making sure you get fed, don't you want them to be wise? Amen? Really? Like, apparently you don't mind if your food pantry people are unwise. They're like, if they're going to be in charge of making sure people get fed, you want them to be wise. Amen? Amen. That's better. All right. So the apostles picked these seven guys. I'm not going to say their names again. It was hard enough the first time. Stephen is fine. The rest of them are a little more complicated. They pick Stephen, who's full of faith and the Spirit, and all these other guys to work with him. And then they, they bring them together, and they put their hand, like they basically ordain these guys and commission them. They're part of the community. They are trusted. They want to serve. They care. The apostles say, we are going to delegate the care ministry, the mercy ministry, these nurturing ministries. We're going to de delegate those to you because we've got to be on our faces before God so that we can hear from him and understand his word and oversee that aspect of the life of the church. This is the beginning that leads us to different sorts of leadership in the life of the church. So you have pastors, you have deacons. You, sometimes pastors are called overseers or elders, and then you have deacons. And the idea is, and the way we do this in the Wesleyan tradition, is that the pastors, the elders, the overseers, are charged with the ministry of the word and the general leadership of the life of the church in partnership with the laity and the lay leadership. The deacons and different sorts of servant ministries are charged with these kinds of ministries of mission, right? Making sure, like recently our missions team made sure some people had coats. Right? Making sure that people at the soup kitchen are getting fed. Making sure that, you know, somebody else was coordinating our relationship with Bethany and First Choice last week. If we're going to be able to embody a ministry that is making sure new people meet Jesus and all of us go deeper with Jesus, we need people to serve. Because one person can't do it all by themselves. Two people can't do it all by themselves. Honestly, it's really easy to burn out Sunday school teachers. It's really easy to burn out people who are engaged in different hospitality ministries because we put so much on so few. It's really crucial if the church is going to be missionally effective to understand that the ministry we have together belongs to, doesn't belong to any one person. It belongs to all of us together. We share this. We share this ministry. And the language of minister doesn't belong exclusively to me or Manny or Tanya or Josh or Allie or Myra or any, any of those of us who are on the payroll. The language of minister belongs to all of us, to all of you. I'm tempted to say, raise your hand if you're a minister. Someone's not listening. All of you should have your hands in the air right now. Like, put them up. This is how it works. Right? And, how, and, and this is nothing new. This is, this is not even remotely anything new. Right Here in Acts chapter 6, you have the apostles incorporating more people into the ministry. You get on into the New Testament. You get to Ephesians. And Paul starts talking about how uh, there are different gifts that God gives people, and, and one of the gifts is pastor-teacher, which sounds a lot like what the apostles are doing here, and he says it's the job of the pastor-teacher to do, well, let me, does anyone remember what he says it's the job to do? To equip the saints for what? Somebody say it. For the work of ministry. Ministry's your job, not mine. <laughs> it's all our job. That's an overstatement, but you get the point. People who are ordained are ordained to put the church in a position so that everyone is engaged in ministry. Like, I want you to leave yourself 
I want you to leave this place today thinking, I am a minister of the gospel. I am a minister of the kingdom. You are ministers of the kingdom. You, all of you. And it's our job, pastors, staff, lay, lay leaders, to make sure that all of us are equipped and deployed for the ministry. Because if only a handful of people are doing it, remember that old adage, 20% of the people do 80% of the work? Like if that's how an organization runs, don't expect to get much done. Or you might get some stuff done, but you won't get done nearly what you can do if 100% of the people do 100% of the work. Not even close. We get on further into the New Testament, we get to 1 Timothy, and Paul, is, it's gotten to the point where he's saying, like, here are the qualifications to be a, 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 an elder, a pastor, and here are the qualifications to be a deacon, to have this servant ministry. So these things are getting, this, this sort of delegation of responsibility is getting more concrete as the church gets decades and decades into it. And it's a reminder, right, that ministry isn't for professionals, it's for everyone. Ministry is not for professionals, it's for everyone, and missional effectiveness depends on our shared ministry. We've got to share it if we want it to work. Nobody gets to sit on the sidelines, nobody gets to sit in the bleachers. We're all on the field, we're all engaged until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And then he'll have something else for us to do afterwards. But for the meantime, we're all engaged in the ministry as we wait for the Lord Jesus. John Wesley understood this and built it into Methodism. Like this is Wesleyan Methodist DNA. Wesley, in the 1700s, had what you call lay preachers. He knew that, you know, <laughs> he couldn't depend on the clergy to get the job done. And so what did he do? He went to the coal mines and started recruiting people, started preaching the gospel. He went out to the farm villages, preaching the gospel. The power players, the bishops, rejected him and criticized him for preaching outside to people he shouldn't be preaching to. But Wesley knew the Holy Spirit wanted to work through everyone to expand the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Wesley goes out, and he starts recruiting people. He's like, hey, I know you're not ordained, but that doesn't matter. I've got to work. I've got, here's some ministry for you. And I need you to get this group of people together, and, and, and I need you to lead some prayer time. He called them band meetings. Anybody in one of those? You're doing ministry. You are ministers, and that's very much in our Wesleyan Methodist DNA. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. He would bring people together. Hey, I need some folks to organize this ministry. He's traveling all over England. He can't be in every place at every time. And so he organizes the laity to do the ministry. And one scholar of all things, John Wesley, is well known for saying that John Wesley organized to beat the devil. That's all it took. A little organization. A little shared ministry. Power of the Spirit with a group of people who believed they were the ministers, not just the guy who gets ordained by the Church of England. They share that. You are here today as worshipers in the Wesleyan tradition because the guy who launched the movement believed the ministry belongs to the laity. To you that we share this and if we're not embracing a shared ministry the kind of thing we see in acts the kind of thing we see throughout the new testament the kind of thing we see through the history of the church particularly in our wesleyan movement at its foundation and at its best if we don't embrace this i don't think we get to call ourselves methodists or wesleyans got to be something else because wesleyans share this stuff people in our tradition people grounded in the life of the New Testament, people who pay attention to Jesus. <laughs> right? Because what does Jesus do? He doesn't do it all himself. He brings the 12 together. He teaches them, he instructs them, he equips them, and then what does he do? He says, all right, it's your turn, guys. Go cast out some demons. 
Come back and let me know how it works out. Go preach the gospel. Come back and give me a report. We'll talk about it. Action, process, learning, development, all of these things. This is how it works. And that has been the church. When the church has been at its best and its most effective, that's the way it's done. If you leave it all to the preachers, it's going to be a mess, I'm here to tell you. Like if you just think the preachers can handle all the ministry, just get ready for a messy ministry that's disorganized and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like we need the gifts and talents of the whole church to share the stunning magnitude of the thing God has called us to do. I mean, remember what this is about. This is about getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. And if you think I can do that by myself, you don't know me very well. If you think you can do that by yourself, you'll probably think a little too much of yourself. The good news is when the Holy Spirit shows up, we can do it with the church together. Because missional effectiveness depends on shared ministry. So the question then is, what's your share? You should be asking that question already, but if you haven't, here it is. What's your share? How can you contribute? And many of you already do. There are always needs. More and more and more. Like as people meet Jesus, as the church grows in breadth and depth, there's always new ministry. We need Sunday school teachers. We need some folks to help Wayne welcome people at the door in the mornings. <laughs> we need folks, we need somebody to stand at the other door in the mornings and make sure people know where the bathroom is when they show up. It's not very hospitable if you don't make sure people know where the restroom is. I'm just telling you right now. We need folks to make sure the students get fed on Sunday evenings. We need people who will rock babies in the nursery and play with them. We've recently had to expand our nursery into multiple rooms because there's so many babies back there. Guess what that means? There are more slots on the serve team for the nursery. <laughs> Every week on one of those tables back there, there's a piece of paper that says serve team at the top. And that paper is answering the question, what's my share of our shared ministry? If you haven't picked one up, grab one on your way out. Take it home and ask the Lord, where do you want me to serve in this shared ministry? He may impress upon your heart to serve in a place that you're afraid of or makes you uncomfortable. It's likely that's what he'll do. The question is, are we willing to obey him? Are we willing to say no to ourselves so we can say yes to Jesus and to the church and to the ministry he's entrusted to us. What's your share in the ministry of the life of the church? Just a moment, we're going to share Holy Communion. As I was reflecting on this morning's text and on communion and Jesus shares his whole life with us. Everything he's got, he shares it to the end, to the utmost, to the point of death. Perfect love shown in his wounded body. He shares everything with us so that we can receive our share in the ministry of his body. And he gave us a meal, didn't he? A meal in which he said, this is my body. And when you eat this, you become a part of the body, my body. And you participate in a covenant and the goal of that covenant is to bring everyone on the face of the planet to the table. To participate in the body. 
a shared ministry given to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope my prayer today as you come in a moment and receive the bread and the cup is that the Lord Jesus Christ will impress upon each and every one of our hearts. Here's the next step for me in the shared ministry. The Lord's been asking me to do this sort of ministry, and I've been hesitant because, honestly, I don't really want to give up the time and energy. But his body was broken and his blood was shed so that I could be made whole, and that means I'm willing to embrace my share in the ministry. What's, what's your share?